Glad to see you this morning in our worship hour. And here we are, back in the pastor's study. So we're having a great time this morning, though, as we study the Word of God. Here's a question I want to ask. What kind of church do you and I need today? That's what we're going to be asking. We're going to be taking a look and seeing the kind of church that God would have today that would really be just perfect in this type of world in which we're living in. So there's some myths. You take a look at when people cry out for social uh, social justice and, and, and you know, the, the racism word being flashed here and there. And, and it, it's just really amazing to see people talking about how the church is really divided. But today, what we're going to take a look into, what kind of church is God looking for today? See, when I take a look at God's word, and especially here in the book of Acts, if you've been studying for the last several weeks, the book of Acts, we saw the church engaged uh, the week before, and then last week we saw the church all excited. And so today, we're going to take a look and see the church as an example, and, and what the church should really be. And here God has laid down for us in the book of Acts the kind of church that he's looking for. See, what we need to be interested in is, uh, is the church of the first century. See, if the first century church is what God established and the apostles were there, Jesus is the one that said, I'll build a church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what kind of church was that? Well, a good model that we're going to discover is that church there in Jerusalem. So take your Bibles with you and let's look at Acts chapter 4. As we look here at Acts chapter 4, we're going to start reading there at verse 31. We're going to see the kind of church that I believe God would be pleased with today. Number one, I want you to see that this kind of church, what it's up to. Well, look what's happening here in verse 31. It says that when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Oh, I tell you what, when you take a look at this church here, the kind of church that I believe that God would desire today is a church that has an astounding prayer life. Take a look at them. See, here they were when the church had prayed. I said, what kind of prayer life? Well, it was all astounding at once. The place was shaken. Oh, when you see what was happening, it, it would bless your heart. Now, what was so important about their prayer life? Well, take a look. He said, when the church gathered together. Catch that now. Gathered together. See, that's all they're united here. It was shaken. See, they were praying together. It was shaken. And they were all filled. With the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit has come to indwell a believer. And now that's the Spirit of God, the first person of the Trinity, is empowering the church to accomplish its mission. And I don't know what mission the church was. It was the Great Commission. It breaks my heart today when I see, see churches that's lost the focus. They're more concerned about uh, uh, items like social issues instead of the Great Commission. See, whenever the Great Commission is the focus of a church and people come to the foot of the cross and they're united together, it takes care of all social issues. See, what the world needs today is a church that's praying like it should. See, when you're talking to God, see, what's so interesting about their prayer life, their prayer life was guided by the Word of God. Take a look with me there a little bit earlier, there at verse 24. Notice what happened. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. See, they were praying, and he said, Sovereign Lord, understand this. When you recognize God for who he is, when you recognize that he's the God that's in control, and we're not in control. See, we have this idea that I want what I want. What a believer, he looks at life, not what I want, but what does he want. See, our Lord is the sovereign one. He's, a, no, he's the one who made heaven and earth. Look at verse 24. Who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything that is in it. And notice how the word of God guided their prayer life. What you discover is through the mouth of our father David. If you're in the Old Testament, David, what did he do? Well, he's quoting the scripture. What he said by the Holy Spirit. Understand this. If we're in line with God, God is number one in our He's our sovereign. He's our king. He's our master. Scripture says that. He's our master. And we're his children. You understand? He is number one. He is the one that we worship. He's the one that we follow. See, understand this. We will all be united together at the foot of the cross. 
whenever we look to him and we honor him, it's not what we want, it's what the master wants. It's what does the king want? What does the sovereign Lord desire? Well, what you think, what you uh, look and you see here they come, they're praying and see their prayer life was guided by the word of God. But only was it guided by the word of God. Understand, God responded to their prayers and it was granted to them. See, that prayer line, it was granted by the grace of God. Take this word, it says, says they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. See, it's so interesting when you take a look and you see what was going on and what was that. See, their hearts were shaken. See, they were filled. Holy Spirit, they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. And see, it's so interesting when you take a look and you see, well, what was so bold about it? Well, look, where was so happy? Look at me in verse 28, here in chapter 4. Notice how it was, how it was uh, guided and granted by the word of God. Look, to do whatever your hand, that's God's hand, what God is in. And your plan, he had predestined to take place. Understand, God is in control. Oh, whenever we pray. Whenever, aren't you glad that whenever we pray that we're able to move the hand of God? Oh, I tell you what, when God's people today, when God's people today, we unite together at the foot of the cross, coming boldly to that throne of grace, as we told us was in our prayer, we're able to cry out to that sovereign Lord. Oh, I tell you what, I see a church that is moving today. A church is doing what God would have them do. It's one that has an astounding prayer life. One that is guided by the word of God and granted by the work of God, how God is working. You see, not only some, but some of all, we call it great in just a few moments. But oh, it's exciting when you take a look and you see this church. This church is a great church. This church is a good church, a good example for us today. Number one, because it had an astounding prayer life. I want to ask you right now. See, a, a, an astounding church is made up of astounding members. An astounding member will have an astounding prayer. I want to encourage you to spend time with God in prayer every day. I'm not talking about just this. Do you spend more time on Facebook than you do in prayer? Hmm, that's a question that you can ask yourself. You know, do I spend more time watching Andy Griffith or some other show on television than I'm spending in prayer to God? Look at your life and say, in my church, I know the past. Uh, my desire is, and my, and my focus as a pastor is to guide my people, the people that I, that I get to lead and, and shepherd, to spend time with, oh my God, in prayer. I tell you what, a great church is a praying church. Not just a great church, a praying church. You know, a great church is also has an amazing partnership. You say, well, brother, you know what you did? Well, take a look at me, verse 22. Now the full number of those who believe were of one heart, that's what it says, one heart, one soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but that he had, they had everything in common. Now, don't you understand what they discovered? When they're at the foot of the cross, when they're, when they're in Christ, we're all equal. We're all united. We're part of a team. See, there's no I in team. Good coaches will trust me that. See, a team is all of us working together, together experiencing a ministry. See, that's what a church is all about. Oh, let me tell you, a church, a, a church that's the kind of church we should have today is one that has a, an astounding prayer life. I tell you what, that church that also needs to have an amazing partnership working together. Like a team, a good team. Let, let me share. Notice what he says that that there in verse 22 says, Now the full number of those who believe were of one heart, one soul. I'd like for you to take your Bible very quickly today and turn over to the book of Galatians. I wanted to share this with you sometime this summer. Today. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. I want you to listen to what the Bible tells us there. There is no, you catch this now. There's neither Jew or Greek. There's neither slave or free. There's no uh, male or female. 
for they are all one in Christ Jesus. When you take a look and you see, like last night in Atlanta, Georgia, where the women was being thrown out, a man that was shot, you, you know, all the discord that's going on. And, 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 and what is the problem? You know, people say, well, there, there's two sides to everything. Well, let me show you something. In the church, we're one. I tell you who's like Jesus Christ is one. He's one. And we're united together as a body. And see, a body, as Jesus described, has to be together. You, there's not pieces here and there. We're all united together. And so when you take a look and you see here in verse in verse 32, see that number, the full number. They remember on the day of Pentecost? On the day of Pentecost, and just earlier, whenever the church was established, people were, you had Romans, you had the Jews, you had slaves. By the way, 70% of the Roman Empire at that time were slaves. And you think about that. During that time, did now, now understand this. Jesus lived during that time when 70% of the people were slaves. Now, it really amazes me whenever we look back and, and, uh, and we see those issues in the past. Now, what we need to be concerned about is who we are today. What are we? See, we should be able to be united together at the foot of the cross, realizing whether you're a person of, uh, of wealth or a person of poverty. We're one in Christ Jesus. We're all the children of him. See, if you're a child of God, if you're a son or daughter of God, See, we're all equal. That's what we've let us know here from Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. And oh, when you take a look and you see this church, it's really amazing. It's the miracle of it all. Oh, I tell you what, there's an amazing heart that's in There's an astounding prayer life. And I want you to notice one of these things. You take, take a look with me here at verse 33. This is the kind of church we need today. And with great power, great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and great grace was upon them. Remember when I told you a little earlier about that amazing grace? Now, do you understand that grace doesn't deal with our goodness? Grace doesn't deal with our greatness. Grace is God's riches by the Holy Spirit. What we discover is this church was the kind of church that we should have today because it had, it, it had an astounding prayer life. And see, the people were praying. And not only that, there was an amazing partnership. They all worked together. They were a team. They were a team player. No, I. Everyone did what they could for the body. And then finally, uh, when you take a look, there was an astounding power that came about when they were united together. See, what happened? The gospel blossomed. See, the gospel expanded. Many people were getting saved. I uh, opened up by talking a little bit about many of the mainline denominations that are declining in their numbers and having fewer baptisms. Of course, uh, many of you probably know that I, I'm in Castle Park, Texas, church in the Southern Baptist. But within the within Southern Baptist, there's a third of our churches that baptized last year zero. That's sad. The decline in our baptism rate really has sharply taken place. Uh, we've always been a growing denomination, but now we're a declining denomination. It, it's almost like when you taught school, you wanted to keep your class on task. You, you wanted them to have a focus on what they should be up to. See, the Great Commission, that's the main thing. Today, many of our churches have gotten off on a tangent. They're, they're, they're not involved in the Great Commission. They're more involved in social justice, social issues. Uh, they, they're, they're involved in, in these areas that, uh, that may be good, but that's not the purpose of the church. That's not what we do. You know, I'm not competing with Chick-fil-A and seeing how I taught that church in that chicken sandwich that compares to Chick-fil-A. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is to share the gospel. 
our purpose to reach lost people. That is our purpose. That's our objective. Southern Baptist this week at Brother Barr here the Presbyterian Convention saying and spending more time talking about the gavel that he can use at the Southern Baptist Convention than the gospel with which he shared with his believers. That breaks my heart. We've lost our focus. As a school teacher, as a coach, we've got to get on tap. We've got to get focused. What are we here for? It's not the number of first downs that you make, it's the number of games you win. That you can that you can make a lot of first downs and still lose the game. Our focus to be winning to playing football. Our purpose and focus as a church is to exalt the Savior in the way they call him. We've got to evangelize sinners. That's the Great Commission. That's the one thing that we won't be able to do in heaven that we, we can only do here on this earth. So what kind of church do we need today? We need a church today. And this is what the church needs today in this world. They have an astounding prayer where they're in touch with God, where they're connected to God. See, we want to have that kind of church where our prayer life it is astounding. And what's just that? That where we have an amazing partnership where we're all working together as a body, as a team, to accomplish the Great Commission. And then, of course, we need to have an astounding, I, I guess, astonishing power. Because that's what happened when they were united together as a great power. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the main thing. Instead of talking about statues, instead of talking about gavels, instead of talking about all those things, you know what we need to be talking about? We need to be talking about the one who went to the cross for us, who died for us, and was buried and raised again the third day. He is the one that's able to make the difference in a person's life. He's the one that's able to give eternal life. That should be the focus of the church. And oh yes, do you want the great grace to be upon him? God's riches at Christ's feet. God's grace, that amazing grace. We all, we all know that hymn, Amazing Grace. You know that the author of that hymn was a slave trader. You know what God's grace can do? He can change a person from the inside. And that's what he did for him. I want to share about a guy in my church in Louisiana. He's a great guy. He was, he was, he was a character above all characters. And they, they called him a nickname, Captain. Captain. And I remember when I first became pastor of the church, the first time I met with my deacon. Now you have to understand, this would have been way back in the early 80s. They had some racial situations that had gone on in the community. And the pastor, I mean, the deacon told the pastor that was before me that, that if someone of another race came in, that they would pray for something for them. I told him, I said, look, God's called me to preach the gospel to set the end. That's what I'm going to do. And if y'all leave, y'all can leave. But I'm going to be preaching the gospel because that's what God's called me. And my children and my wife are going to be here. And they're going to hear the gospel. And if that business stays with us, they're going to hear how Jesus loved them. How Jesus died for them. And that's what he's going to do. Catman, he was one of the deacons. And uh, he was adamant. That next Sunday, I happened to have preached from 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 through 21. I, I want you to give a little chance to turn over there. But look over in 1 John chapter 4, there at verse 20 and 21. It goes like this. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Did you hear that? If a person says that he loves God and he hates his brother, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother. I gave an invitation after preaching from 1 John chapter 4 
cat man, one of the guys that I met with, that told me to shut the church down. No worship services. Someone from the opposite opposite race came in. He came down that aisle with tears in his eyes. And he told me, he said, he said, Brother Henry, I'm not going to get to go to heaven because I hate my brother. He said, I can't do that. He said, I'm going to love my brother. And my brother can come here and worship anytime. And let me share something with you. That church went through revival because they came to the foot of the cross. And they wanted their brother, their sister, regardless of the color of their skin, to be a child of God and to go to heaven. See, we're all going to heaven together. We might as well get used to it down here. And let's love as Christ has loved us. That's the kind of church we need today. Jesus said, whosoever may come unto me, whosoever comes to me, he will not cast out. Let's be a whosoever will church. And that's the kind of church that God is looking for today. Today.